it is officially summer, and with that being said, we are going to start a new sermon series from the book of James, a new summer sermon series from the book of James, and I've titled it, Living Out Your Faith. So take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of James. James is a wonderful, challenging Word of God. By way of introduction, let me just say that the book of James is, is not a book of deep doctrine. It's not a defense of Christianity, nor an explanation of how to be saved. But rather, it's a letter that was written to individuals who are assumed to know the basics of the faith. And its intention is to drive home the importance of living out the truth. You see, it's one thing to know the truth. It's a whole other thing to live it out. And this is what James is challenging his readers. He is saying, you know what's right. You know the truth. You have the faith. Now, let's put it into action. Let's live it out. That's when it becomes real faith. That's when it becomes genuine faith. That's when it becomes real in your life. And this is what James here is addressing as he writes to believers who are being persecuted, who are struggling in their walk. And he says, just stay strong, stay firm in your faith. Sometimes that's hard. As we will read here in the first chapter, because they were facing some, some trials. Just as we face trials in our own lives. And so the central theme of, of James's letter is living out your faith. He is basically saying, if, if you believe, if you say you believe, then why do you live as you don't? Now, how will they know that you're a Christian? And how you live your life. Live out your faith. And this is what James here is challenging us to do. And he addresses a lot of ways to, to live out our faith. And in, in the book, he talks about your faith in the midst of trials. He's talking about living out your faith and in, in listening and doing the word of God. Faith and action, faith in works. He talks about taming the tongue and, and then not showing favoritism. And so James begins his letter in, in verse 1 by identifying himself merely as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes to the 12 tribes who are scattered among the nations. And he gives them this greeting in his letter. Now, he begins his letter by identifying himself as James, a bondservant of God. Now, I love that because he identifies himself, hey, I'm just a slave to my master and Lord, my God. What a great way to, to start out and introduce yourself. And so he makes a strong demand for a transformed living in our daily conduct. Now, James, if you remember, is the half-brother of Jesus. He is also the author of this book that is named after him. And don't you know it was tough to be the brother of Jesus? I mean... As anyone with brothers and sisters will acknowledge, comparison is inevitable. Now, most of us have heard the statement, well, why can't you be just more like your brother or your sister? Now, how do you know, how do you think James must have felt to literally have a perfect brother? I wonder if James didn't hear, James, why can't you be more like Jesus? You know what? We all should be more like Jesus, amen? Amen. And this is what James here is challenging us. He's saying, be more like Jesus. Live out your faith. Put your faith in action, even when you don't want to. Even when it's inconvenient. Even when you're facing trials and persecution. Live it out. Be more like your brother. Be more like your Lord Jesus. <laughs> oh, James, well, he really gets to the point here in, the, in his book. And, and I love it because... Um, you know, he doesn't speak over our heads. He just speaks right to our hearts. And so, you know, if James probably heard that many times growing up. Well, why can't you just be more like your, your brother Jesus? But not only did James come to the faith, he was also considered an apostle. He became a, a pastor of a church in Jerusalem. He was a man that was noted for his deep faith and, and his strong prayer life. 
And so here James is writing to a group of primarily Jewish believers who are undergoing some severe hardships. You see, they were being hated and despised. They were hated by the Gentiles because they were Jews. And the Jews hated them because they were Christians. And so rather than consoling them, James in his letter challenges them. He challenges them to rethink their difficulties. He challenges them to trust God even in the middle of their trials, even in the middle of the testing and the circumstances. You know, this modern notion that becoming a Christian will make your life easier would be a totally foreign concept to James. In fact, James is saying that it is our response to trials that prove the reality of our faith. You see, someone once said that Christians are like tea bags. You don't know what's in them until you put them in hot water. Amen? And, and, and if you're not in hot water now, you will be in hot water sometime in your life. Because God tests us. He tries us, as we find out here a little bit later in this chapter, because he wants to produce something in you. He has a purpose and a plan for everything. And now, we too face some of the same challenges as the believers to whom James was writing this letter. But how do we deal with the challenges that we face in our lives? Oftentimes, we ask the question, how can I avoid the trials? And the real question should be, how can I change the way I respond to trials? You see, trials are going to come. It's inevitable. But how you choose to respond is up to you. The truth is you can't avoid trials. But what you can change is the way you react to them. And so this morning I would like to share some simple principles that can change the way we deal with difficulties that we face in our lives. But before we get into that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to gather in your name to worship you and to praise you. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just open up our hearts, our ears, and our minds that we may hear directly from you today. Father, speak through me your words only. And Father, just open up our hearts to receive them as, as James challenges us here with these words, Lord, that we may take our faith and, and put it into action, Lord, and know that you're with us even in the difficult times of life. Father, we thank you for your word and its truth, and we ask that you speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Difficulties. Nobody likes them. Nobody wants them. We all try to avoid them, but you know what? It cannot be done. Difficulties come to everyone. We see this in verse 2 as James begins his letter. He says, consider it. Pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. We don't like that one. Consider it joy. Count it as joy when you face trials of many kinds. But I don't want us to focus on the word joy just yet. I want us to focus on the word when. If you mark in your Bible, circle the word when in this verse. When... You face trials. Now, James is telling us that trials, they're not optional. They're inevitable. You're going to face them. You live in this world, whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to face trials. You're going to face testing. You're going to face difficulties. It's inevitable. But James is not saying if you encounter trials. He is saying when you encounter trials. It was Oswald Chambers who wrote, and I quote, To choose suffering makes no sense at all. To choose God's will in the midst of suffering makes all the sense in the world. And yet James here is saying, My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of trials. Now, the word many kinds means there are going to be various kinds of trials. Okay? 
We're all going to face many trials as, as, as a number of trials that we face. But James here is being more specific. He's saying not just that you're going to face many, many trials, but you're going to face many different kinds of trials. And certainly you have faced many different kinds of trials in your life. As you go through different seasons in your life, you're going to face different kinds of trials in your life. And so here, this is what James is talking about. There will be many varieties of trials. And the troubles may be a loss of a job, a broken relationship, difficulties at work, an untimely death of a family member, lingering illness, depression, a wayward child. Whatever the kind of trial it may be, do not be overwhelmed. Do not be overwhelmed. Because James says, in effect, trials will come. But the question is, how will you respond to the trial? What will happen to your faith? Will you stand firm in your faith in the midst of the trial or in the face of the trial? Or will your faith crumble? Will it fall? Will it falter? Will it strengthen? And so the trial will come. So if your faith, is no, your faith is no good in times of trouble, then it's no good. If your faith in God is only good for when you're doing well, then, then what good is your faith? You see, true faith is sustained uh, when everything is going wrong. That's when it strengthens. The genuineness of our faith is tested by how it stands up in times of, of trouble and trials and testing. And so, first of all, we need to realize that, that difficulties come to everyone. There's no exclusions here. We all face difficulties. The second thing we must look at in the midst of trial is, is our attitude. Our attitude. Now, attitude helps determine the outcome. As we see here in verse 2, James says... Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, when you experience times of trials in your life, you may ask what? Why? That's a common question we always ask. Lord, why is this happening? I don't understand why this is happening. What is your purpose? What is your plan in all of this? I don't get it, God. But have you ever really looked for the answer? Or did you just throw your arms up in the air and discuss and blame God and turn bitter? You know, how, do you, how did you feel about it? How did you react to it? What kind of thoughts went through your mind? What was your attitude? Was it one of anger or frustration or disappointment or failure? But look again at the verse. But this time I want you to circle the word count or consider. James says, my brothers, count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of trials. Now, this word count is an accounting term, and it means to evaluate. It means to add up. It means to tally. And so here James is dealing with the attitude that we need to have if we are to benefit from our trials. He says, consider it all joy in the midst of our trials. That means how we respond. He says, respond with a deliberate, intelligent appraisal of the situation. James doesn't say that, that trials are a joy to go through, but that believers should count them as joy. That's a big difference. There, there's, there's no joy in, in the midst of trial or testing, or, or hard times, but, but James says, count it as joy. Why? Because of what it produces. What it produces in our lives. You see, God has a purpose for the trial. He says, I work all things together for the good of those who love me and are called according to my purpose. All things, good things, and what? Bad things. Trials. Testing. And so count it as joy. Evaluate the situation. Philip Yancey in his book, Where is God When It Hurts, said this, and I quote. He puts it this way. Rejoicing in suffering does not mean Christians should act happy about tragedy and pain when they feel like crying. Such a view distorts honesty. 
and true expression of feelings. Christianity is not phony. The Bible's spotlight is on the end result, the use God can make of suffering in our lives. Before he can produce that result, however, he first needs our commitment of trust in him, and the process of giving him that commitment can be described as rejoicing. You see, it can be joyful because testing of your faith produces perseverance for the next trial. It'll make you stronger for the next trial that will come, the next trial that you face in life. And so, yes, you can count it as joy because it produces perseverance. Which leads to the next thing. We can be certain that God has a purpose. God has a purpose in all things, even in the trial, even in the difficulties. Look with me in verses 3 and 4. He goes on to say, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, this is why you can consider it joy. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, knowing that trials have a purpose can make a big difference in how you face the hard times. Amen? When you can see that, hey, there's a purpose in all of this. I'm going to trust God that there's a purpose in all of this. This really makes a big difference when you're facing a trial. Knowing that God has not abandoned us. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. No matter how you feel, no matter how mad you get at him. Because the Bible tells us what? They that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. Those that what? Wait. Wait. That's the hardest thing to do is wait. Nobody likes to wait. I hate to wait. You know, I don't even like to wait for the green light at the intersection. I want to hit all the green lights. We don't like to wait. We are a want it now society. No, we wanted it yesterday, actually. Why is it taking so long? You know? But those that wait upon the Lord. Now, notice what the trial here produces. It produces patience. <laughs> it produces patience, and that's a hard thing to produce. But notice here, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So God has a purpose. Now, according to James, enduring these tests it produces certain characteristics. And, and he tells us the characteristics in verse 4. In verse 4, he goes on to say, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So the first thing that it produces is maturity. Maturity, or in some translations, uh, to be made perfect. Now, that does not mean that we're going to be sinless, okay? Forget about that. We're not perfect in that way. But spiritually, we will become more mature in our faith. We'll be more seasoned in our Christian walk, all right? And that prepares us for the next trial. That prepares us to walk through this life. The second thing it produces, you'll be not only more mature, but you'll be made, what? Complete. Complete. Now, this word complete meaning made whole, fully developed in your Christian experience. You'll be made more like Christ. That's God's plan. That's God's will, that you be made more like him. Complete. And then the third thing that it produces is not lacking anything. Now, this means that God will provide everything you need to remain obedient in your life of faith. Now, isn't that good to know that he's going to give us everything we need in order to be faithful? You know, a Christian faith, it will be tested. Your faith will be tried. Your faith will be tested. You will go through the fire. You will face the trial. And you're not alone. Read all throughout the scripture. Did he not test Moses? Moses! I want you 
to go back to where you came from and face Pharaoh. Pharaoh? Yes, Pharaoh. Well, I don't want to go see Pharaoh. <laughs> there was a trial. There was a testing. But God said what? I am who I am. And I'll give you everything you need. Will you what? Will you trust me? Now, what do you think that did for Moses' faith when he finally went back and he saw what God did? Noah, I want you to build an ark. An ark, Lord, what is that? A huge boat. Where? On the middle of dry ground. I'm going to bring a flood. What's the flood? It's rain. What's rain? It's because it hadn't rained ever up until that point. But Moses, although tested and tried and ridiculed by his own friends and mocked, he was faithful. He was blessed. Gideon. Oh, Gideon, a little runt. He was hiding out in fear of his life from the Midianites. And God comes up to him and he says, Midian, I'm going to use you to lead an army against the Midianites. Me, Lord. Oh, I'm not qualified. Yes. Round up some men. Well, you got too many men. Get them down to 300. 300? Yes, 300. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. There's the testing of our faith every day. Every day. Why? Because he wants to mature us. He wants to complete us and know that you will lack nothing. He will give you everything you need to increase your faith. Here's the thing, though. If I abandon my faith in the midst of the trial, then I'm setting myself up for failure for the next trial. But if I stand in faith, I will be stronger when the next trial comes. Don't you know that Moses was stronger the next trial came? Don't you know that Gideon would be stronger? Don't you know that Moses would be stronger? Don't you know that you would be stronger when the next trial comes? And then fourthly, know this, that we're not intended to go through the trial alone. And I'm so thankful for that. Look with me in verse 5. Verse 5 says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in anything he does. Notice here that we are not intended to go through the trial alone. And I am so thankful for that. Notice here, if you need wisdom in the midst of the trial... God will grant that. Now, this wisdom is spiritual wisdom. It is divinely provided by God himself through his word and prayer. Now, notice here also that this wisdom is not given automatically. You must what? Ask for it. Believers must ask of God, that is to pray for God to provide divine insight on how to handle the testing, on how to handle the situation. God does not promise that the wisdom be given will cause the outcome of the trial to just disappear. But it will accomplish his purpose in the one being tested. He says, I will give you the wisdom in the midst of the trial. He says, sometimes I'll take the trial away, but sometimes I want you to go through the trial. And I want to give you the wisdom in how to handle it and the decisions that you need to make. But also notice here that God gives wisdom. Notice here he gives it generously. Generously. You know, I love that because we serve a generous God. He says, if you ask the Lord for wisdom, then he will be faithful to give it generously to all those who ask. Notice here, not only generously, but he also gives it to you without fault. He doesn't say, well, you know what? You don't deserve my wisdom because you made too many mistakes. No, he gives it to you without fault. He says, if you simply ask in faith, 
Faith is the key, and it will be given generously without fault. But verse 6 says what? That you must ask in faith. You must believe. Now, wisdom is applied knowledge. It is knowledge put to use. Because oftentimes in life we may be at a crossroads or, or in the middle of a testing and we may say, Lord, I, I don't know what to do. Which direction do I go? Do I take this job? Do we move to this town? Or, or, or what do I do about this situation about my children? What do we do? You know what James says? He says in a situation like that, you ask God. You ask God. Why? Because he'll let you know what to do. He will give you divine counsel, divine wisdom. He will let you know how to react in a particular situation. Why? Because you can count on him. We're not intended to go through this alone. And then lastly, is that God uses trials as a blessing. Now, I know sometimes in the middle of the trial, we don't see it as a blessing. We don't. We see it as a hardship. But God will use trials as a blessing. In verse 12, it reads, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. James ends this section by saying, Blessed is the man who endures the trial. Now, this is a beatitude, very much the same way as Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus gave the beatitudes, but he says, Blessed is the man who endures trials for when, or literally after the trial is over, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Here is a declaration of the blessedness of one who passes the test. He says, blessed. Now, the word blessed here means happy. Better yet, it means satisfied. Better yet, it means fulfilled with inner joy. Consider it pure joy. You see how it goes full circle. When you've endured the trial, this happiness is due to the victory over the trial. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is a big difference. It's not the ordinary happiness of someone who never knew conflict. It's the exhilaration of one who has fought and won the battle. You ever accomplished something great that was very challenging? It's satisfying. There's joy. You've endured the race. You fought the fight. You finished it. Hallelujah. There's joy in that. There's a blessing in that. There's satisfaction in that. And this is the blessing here. Notice here, the point is simple. The, the person who claims to be a Christian and goes through the trial and, and comes out a winner, which means he, he never gives up on his faith. He never abandons God. He is shown to be a genuine Christian. Notice here, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord will give to those that love him. You know, there are people who come and, and you see them and I see them and, and, and they profess Christ, and they even get baptized, but then trouble comes into their life, and they're gone. I mean, they're gone, and they may never come back. But whatever struggle they had to go through, it was overpowering. And, and they walked away, and they, they shook their fist at God, and they said, that, that's it. You see, perseverance through the trial is proof of living faith. Because why? We all experience trials. We all do. And you can't control the storm. Just like you can't control the weather. You can't control the trials. They're going to come. You're going to face them. There, there's going to be a time of testing. 
but you can choose how you react to it. Know that God has something great in mind. Know that He's with you. Know that He will give you wisdom, direction, guidance, strength, comfort, everything you need so that you will not lack anything. And know that when you've endured the trial, when you've come through the fire, when you've come through the hurt, know that there's a blessing waiting for you. I want to close this morning by sharing with you a thought from Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher and theologian of the 1800s. And he once said this, and I quote, he said, I have always looked back to times of trial with a kind of longing not to have them return, but to feel the strength of God as I felt it then, to feel the power of faith as I felt it then, to hang on to God's powerful arm as I hung on to it then, and see God at work as I saw him then. Let that be your attitude as you count it all joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And Father Lord, it, it, it's difficult to pray your will be done sometimes because your will sometimes requires that, that we go through the testing, that, that we go through the fire, that we face the trial. But, Father, Lord, we know that there are all kinds of trials that we will face in our lives. And, Lord, I know that there are many here today who are facing many kinds of trials. I pray in the name of Jesus that they would just tr completely and wholly trust in you. Father, that they would seek you for, for guidance and wisdom and direction and discernment. And, Father, that you would just pour out your grace upon them and show them your will and your purpose and your plan for them. And Father, as we go through the trial, Lord, may we feel your presence in our lives. Help us to respond in the right way. Help us to live out our faith, even in the midst of the difficulty. And Lord, as we go through the trial and we look back on it, may we give you the praise for what you have done. Father, we thank you for the promise of the blessing that you give us. That you allow these things to happen in our lives, Lord, to strengthen our faith. That you love us that much, Lord, to prepare us and encourage us to make us more like you. And Father, that's my prayer. Lord, even though these kinds of trials come and they're reeling in our lives, help us to never question your love for us. Help us to remember that you are too good to be unkind. That you are too wise to make a mistake and keep us from confusion. Oh Lord, we want to praise you in all that we do. We'll praise you in the good times. We'll praise you in the bad times. We'll praise you all the time for the honor of your name. Amen. Will you stand?